really great to be here. It's a real honor to be here. JP, uh, I never met before uh, coming here. Thank you for reaching out. This is a real honor to be here. Great subject matter, which I'm going to talk a little bit about, but in a very little bit different way. Uh, these are some slides here. We're just going to run here. It's a little bit of the restaurant uh, where I am. Um, my restaurant is in Los Gatos, California. It's in Northern California. Uh, it's about it's in the Bay Area, but it's just on the fringe. It's about an hour south of San Francisco, about halfway between Monterey and San Francisco. We are nowhere near Los Angeles. Um, we are in the foothills of the Santa Cruz Mountains which is the oldest AVA, American Viticultural Area, in the United States. Um, really beautiful area where we are. Um, beautiful mountains reaching the ocean. Uh, the mountains are filled with real small family-run wineries. They work with very sparse soils and very, very low yields, and they make some of the most distinctive wines in America, most of which don't leave the state of California. So if you ever have a chance, uh, it's a great place to visit. It's not Napa or Sonoma. Um, a large part of the identity of the restaurant is a relationship that's now over 10 years old uh, with a farm called Love Apple Farms, uh, biodynamic, in which we have created a closed circle between the restaurants, um, the farm, and our guests. Um, uh, we have worked diligently on growing exclusively just for the restaurants, exact amount of products that we need, uh, we compost, we have a lot of recycling and composting systems that go back to the, uh, to the farm, and we're constantly working on it, especially the biodiversity. Every step we make or new idea we consider at the restaurant, uh, whether it's about the ambience, the service, um, perhaps an exceptional product, we always ask ourselves one question is the decision we're making, is it not only a reflection of who we are, but where we are? Our sense of place is very important to us. Um, Man Race is in its 14th year. We've gone through several incarnations, uh, some expected and planned. We've renovated on two different occasions, and some not so expected. Um, July 4th, which is Independence Day in the United States, uh, in 2014, we were um, on vacation. And on the July 4th weekend, uh, someone broke into the gate to the back of my restaurant and took a bunch of plastic containers and built a pyre around the gas meter of the restaurant and set it on fire with accelerants, uh, with the, as the police department said, a very vicious, calculated, and very well done method to destroy the restaurant as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Um, the gas meter blew. It was 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we, the restaurant's closed. Um, Mondays and Tuesdays, but this happened on Monday morning on uh, the biggest holiday of the year when people knew we were away. And the gas meter went up, caught the roof on fire, and the fire went this way, and someone was walking by at 4 o'clock in the morning and saw it and called the fire department, which was about 150 meters away from the restaurant. I can hit a very bad five wood and hit the fire station. And... Um, the restaurant was about five minutes from being completely destroyed. The rest of that street is a bunch of old wooden buildings, with a bunch of big, mature oak trees. It hasn't rained in California in two years. Everything's a giant tinderbox. And um, it destroyed half the building. It took off the roof and destroyed the kitchen and the entire back of the house. And um, uh, it closed us for about seven months. It took us about seven months to rebuild the restaurant. Uh, I think if it had been five minutes, ten minutes later, uh, there probably wouldn't be a restaurant and I probably wouldn't be here in Galway. Um, it was a big setback, but also I feel incredibly lucky on many different ways. Um, I think it's fair to say that my perspective has changed on many things, both personal and professional, and I have learned a lot about what is really important. Um, I've looked very differently now about how the media plays a role with the restaurant, uh, how important uh, my personal relationships and uh, my relationships with my staff is. I've developed a new perspective on what is really important. I consider myself very lucky that I have found something that I'd love to do with my life. Uh, my father always told me if I found something that I'd love to do, then work would become the highest form of play. 
and he is absolutely right. Um, JP was right about also taking oneself not too seriously, which I think uh, sometimes we tend to do. We're all culinary geniuses in our own minds. Um, uh, I think finding a sense of balance was a big role in allowing us to come back and I think moving forward. So I'm really, really lucky to be here and be granted an opportunity and to talk about sustainable issues and uh, security issues. There are many people here who can speak much more eloquently about this than I ever could. Uh, I try to do it by our actions at the restaurants, working with the farm. The farm is not a political statement, it's a quality statement. We do it because it allows us more control over the products entering the kitchen. If the product was crap, I would not be working with a farm that's so close to the restaurant. Uh, it is important for all of us, all of the established and well-known chefs here, the newer members, younger cooks in our industry, and a very responsible media that we take great advantage of the information that we are gleaning and really just coming to the forefront now that's being presented at this conference. But I'm going to approach it a little bit differently. I have a cook who works for me. He's a great cook. He's a very good employee. 24 years old, uh, he's worked all the stations in the kitchen, named three international restaurants, he's staged at them, he's spent time at them, he's really great. And over the course of the restaurant, you know, during the course of the day, we do projects during the course of the week. It might be to do a classical traditional dish from a different culture for staff meal, work on a sauce, always keeping people busy with side projects, more as a learning or mentoring thing. And his particular project was a very classic Escoffier-based sauce. And he did it, and I went over to critique it. And I said, this is very tasty, and this is very good. Um, but you know, and then I just said, kind of flip, I said, you know, but if Paul Bocuse saw this sauce and tasted this sauce, he would have no idea what you're trying to do. And he says to me, he goes, who's Paul Bocuse? So I, I, I was kind of stumped. I was stumped there for a while. I mean, I'm, I'm an older guy. I was a young cook in a different generation. And I got to thinking about how someone who's devoted his life to this industry had no idea who the leader of the previous generation of chefs um, was beforehand. I'm in an age now where optimistically, where I'm more than halfway through my professional career, myself and my peers, people my age, we came up in a very different environment than we see today, which is obvious on many levels. Pre-internet, before food and cooking networks, before the rise of celebrity chefs and restaurants and the ego-driven projects designed to create a marketable brand. Uh, where did one go to understand our newly chosen profession? You know, when I was a cook, a young cook many years ago, when I wanted to stage, you know, I wrote 10 letters. I paid to have them translated into the languages of where the restaurants were, and I mailed them off, and I waited weeks for a reply. I remember 10 letters, you get seven responses, four say no, three say yes, and it took nine months to set it up. Now, email, email, click, click, stage program, boom, done. We read books, we studied menus. If you were lucky enough as a young cook to go to Europe and eat, you couldn't look for menus online. You just went by word of mouth. Maybe you saw a picture of a menu in a book. And it was a really great time because you developed this level of expectation, anticipation in your mind, what was going to happen when you were walking in the door. It wasn't clicking onto an internet and seeing blow by blow, 20 course meal, any restaurant you want anywhere in the world and show you all the way through. To me, that's a matter of pollution. Um, it gets in the way of your own anticipation and ability to think freely in your mind. There's value in reading and learning about the history of our profession and industry to mine for ideas and inspiration without the, insp uh, the internet and its ability to call anything else. What else does one have? I'm not pining for the old days. I'm, I'm not that much of a curmudgeon yet. Some, yeah. uh, but that is my point. How does one not benefit anyone, especially young cooks now, if you don't understand the people that came before? How are you going to know about the present and how are you going to know about moving forward in the future? And all the issues that make things so much more complex than when I was a young cook. Um, it might be boring or passe. You look at all these old 
cookbooks, old chefs, old stories, and you think, well, the food, you know, it's rich and it's creamy and nobody eats like that anymore. But that's precisely the point why you should know about it, because you know the development of how food was to where we are today, because that's the kind of knowledge that it's going to prevent, that's going to allow you to create and move forward in the future. Um, I don't mean this in a bad way at all. My question would be to anybody here, are we better cooks nowadays than we were with that greatest generation from uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago? Are we better cooks? Do we cook better? I mean, you know, do, do you say that you're, you know, well, we're better cooks than Alain Chappelle and Roger Verger and Paul Bocuse and, and all these folks? But if you think about it, there's more technology kitchen technologies, there's more inf availability of information, there's a democratization of fine dining. You know, back then, fine dining was about a special occasion. No one could eat like that on a regular basis. Now there's great and ambitious food at all different price points all over the world. Um, uh, let's see, give me one moment. So our role is to take this and to create better cooks. The people who work for us now, our goal, our job, is to make them better cooks than we are. It's, sometimes it's a hard thing to say. You never think that's gonna happen. But what it means is that there's a, a chain and we're just links. There's one link and then there's another link and then there's those future links. And we have to understand what our roles are in learning what came before to apply it to the present, and to move forward with it. Um, that is our job, mentoring. Mentoring is not just showing someone how to butcher meat, clean fish, rotate the vegetables, sanitation issues, all that sort of thing. Right now, our role has become even more complex and critical, is that we have to show the younger generation the issues that they're going to be dealing with that we're just talking about now. Someone earlier in the conference, and it's, it's slipping on me now, someone said that 10 years ago, I think it was Mark, 10 years ago, nobody knew about these issues. You never, nobody really, it's kind of a dirty secret, but it wasn't discussed about food security and sustainable food sources. Now it's becoming more and more in the forefront, and now it's just not teaching cooks how to work and maybe perhaps to run a responsible business model, but it's how to deal and be respectful about these issues that are coming forward. It is so important that we collectively, I mean, there's not a lot of culinary geniuses in the world. They come few and far between, and it's generational. But we have the power to work collectively, create a movement by everybody doing a little small part. Um, Paul Bocuse, does anybody not know who Paul Bocuse is? Google him. Okay, that's it. Um, Paul Bocuse was a link in the chain. He was a link in the chain. Paul Bocuse and his peers and the group of people that he worked with, not only in France but elsewhere, his generation, they took cooks out of the kitchen, smoky, dark, shitty work conditions. He took them out of the kitchen and he put them in the front of the media by the sheer force of his talent, his personality, and his drive. None of us would be here. No chefs with any kind of media presence would be up on this stage. You would have no interest in going to Galway to a food symposium if it wasn't for Paul Bocuse. Okay? But he is just a link in the chain, just like all of us are a link in the chain. So what are we going to do about the links in the future? Okay? That's it. That's what I got. <laughs>